Amen. And this worship team that took us into the presence of the Lord. Amen. I was so blessed. I'm so blessed to have a team that has a real relationship with God. When, when you saw that young sister up here singing about the Lord until tears came down her face, that is not scripted. That is not fake. That comes from a real place. We have a relationship with God. And you, if, if anytime you get in a place with God where you don't mind worshiping him until you got tears coming down your face, that's a real thing. Amen. And this church is slowly moving toward a place where we enter into a worship experience and we don't care about what nobody think. Nobody think because he is our God. Chapter, Joshua chapter 3. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. Drop down to verse 5. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. My God. Joshua said to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it and they went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Joshua, today, somebody shout today. today. I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan waters, go and stand in the river. And Joshua said to Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Parasites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and Jebusites. My God. Drop back to verse 7. And I want to read this part here with you. It says, today, somebody shout, today, today, I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. I want to use a simple subject this morning, turning points. That's my subject, turning points. Father, bless your word on today. Make my mind nimble as I submit and humble myself before you. I offer my gift to you. Because you first gave it to me, now use it to your glory and bless this house in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk about turning points. A turning point is defined as a specific, significant moment when a situation starts to change. Get this in an important way. Turning points are critical times in your life where big decisions could lead to big changes, both in work and in life. Turning points. These are defining moments, and you'll have them often in life. These are critical turns where if you are a spiritual discerning person, you can sense that something is shifting, something in the atmosphere. You can't really put your finger on it, but there's something in your knower that knows that this is a turning point. That it, 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 It's weird because, because you understand that this is not an ordinary meeting. This is not an ordinary event. This is not an ordinary occasion. This is not an ordinary service. It's not an ordinary sermon. That there's something about this moment that you have that you sense in your spirit that this is going to be a turning point. I've had those moments in my life where I've met people. I've met a lot of people, but there sometimes there's certain people I meet, and I can tell that this is a destiny moment. That after meeting you or conversing with you or being in your presence, I knew that there's something that was going to change significantly about my life. I knew that something about me, and sometimes I've even asked some people when I met them, who are you that I'm supposed to know you? And it's weird because it's not always important people. It's not always, some of us always chase after important people or influential people or powerful people. But sometimes it's people that you don't even know. No name people, real obscure people, but I knew in that moment that I met you that my life was never going to be a change, that never going to be the same. It was going to be a turning point. You follow what I'm saying? That there's something, and so you have to be a, a spiritual person to understand that. It's almost like Jesus. Jesus at one time had a woman that snuck up behind him with a wish of blood and touched him. And the Bible said that virtue went out of him. And he said, Who touched me? 
right? And they said, well, listen, all kind of people are touching you. Everybody's touching you. Yeah, but it was something about the way she touched me that there was something supposed to happen. And I don't know about you, but there are certain people that I've met along the journey, met people I've met along the path. I'm nice to everybody. I like to meet people. I'm a people person. They laugh at me. They call me the lobby pastor because I'm out in the lobby speaking and shaking hands and kissing babies. That's just naturally me. That's not even a, a put on. That's how I am, Charlene. But sometimes, every once in a while, I meet somebody or I'm in a situation or I'm in an opportunity and I can sense in my knower that this, oh God, is a turning point. Well, you've sat in services and you've heard sermons and you've heard messages and you've heard preachers, but there's something about this moment. See, it's almost like what happens with birds or what happens with plants. Plants and birds don't live by a calendar. They sense and they know that there's a change in the season. They don't walk around with a date book saying, okay, this is supposed to be spring today. No. And even if they're off, even if, even if, even, even if, even if the day on the calendar doesn't fit the blossoms that's coming out on the trees, the trees are announcing that the season has changed. It's not on my calendar. And so what I'm trying to tell somebody in this room right now is that God said your season is about to change. That you are about to hit a turning point. And everything that you're going through is announcing to you that something is about to shift. Something is about to change. Something is about to, this is going to be, oh God, who am I talking to? This is about to be a game changer. This is not an ordinary meeting. You took the appointment, but it's not an ordinary meeting. It's going to be a game changer. You, you, you took the opportunity, but you don't realize that this is about to be a game changer. It's going to change everything about the world. It's going to change everything about how you see the world. And it's going to change everything about how the world sees you. Oh, God, I just feel prophetic in here. That, 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 that for somebody, you have to realize that this was not an ordinary day. It started out like an ordinary day, but I can already sense in the air that something has already moved. How many people sense God doing something and it's going to be a move? You joining this church was a game changer. I didn't just put my name on the roll. I didn't just take a job here. This is a game changer. I'm connected to you for a reason. There's a reason you crossed my path. There's a reason why I'm in this city at this time in this place and you crossed my path. Maybe it was by accident. Maybe you caught me online. Maybe you caught a clip on YouTube. But there's something about this ministry at this point. Have you ever had a word that you needed at a time you desperately needed it? The best message I've ever heard in my life was a message that I heard when I really needed it. When I was going through something and the man of God was preaching and had no clue I was about to make a decision. But I came at the right moment and that message became my favorite message because it was a game changer. Look at somebody, this is a game changer. So in our text, we're reaching the last leg of what seemed like a never ending journey through the wilderness en route to the promised land. God had miraculously uh, delivered his people from Pharaoh, but because of sin and disobedience, they found themselves wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. What was supposed to be a two-week journey had turned into a 40-year multi-generational saga, going through the same thing over and over, different names, different places, different faces, but the same thing over and over. How many people in here can be honest and say, I'm sick? of going through the same thing over and over. <sighs> Where you feel stuck. And no matter what you do, and no matter how many times you try to recalculate or reroute, you get back to the same thing over and over. It's a different name, but the same thing. I'm at a different job, but I'm experiencing the same sort of issues. I got a different relationship, but I'm still having the same results. I'm in a different church, different pastor, different name and everything, but I'm still having the same experiences. And I keep wondering why I keep going through the same thing over and over and over again. And, and, and this is what bothers me the most. Has anybody ever been in a situation where it seemed like have you ever been somewhere where something is taking longer than you thought? 
I thought I'd be through this by now. I thought I'd be past this by now, Daphne. I calculated that it's going to be about two weeks and I'll be past this. But now two weeks has turned into two months. And something that I thought would take six months has turned into six years. And I, I, I understood the breakup, but I thought that I'd be over it by now. It's been six years since the divorce, but I'm still living through the same feelings that I had six years ago. And I thought by now, is there anybody that knows the feeling of thinking by now, I thought I'd be through this. I thought by now I'd be married. I thought by now I would have had my credit together. I thought by now I would have had a better opportunity, a better job. By now, I've been through this long enough, and I'm trying to talk to somebody in here right now who's been going through something over and over and over again, and you're dealing with the frustration of thinking, by now, I should be through this. I thought what I was going through with my child was just a phase, but this phase has lasted six years. By now, we should have been done with this. And here we are, stuck in a pattern, stuck in a place, stuck in a space, because I'm feeling like I'm never going to have a turning point. When does the madness stop? When does the foolishness stop? When do we keep, when do we stop going through this cycle, cycle of pain, cycle of disappointment? Some of us have been through it so long that you've begun to expect disappointment. You don't even expect things to be better. You walk in saying, it's going to be bad in a minute. <laughs> You're used to bad things happening. You're used to relationships going wrong. You're used to people turning their mind and turning their backs and turning their thoughts away from you. And you've just gotten into this place where I just expect, how, 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 long, how long is this relationship going to last? About a week? I already know. I already know how this goes. How long will I be in this church? What, about a year? I've been to this church, I've been to that church, I've been to that church, and I already know coming in the door. I'm joining today, but I know I'm, going, I'm hitting my watch right now, my stopwatch right now, because I'm on about a year going through the cycles. But Jordan, Jordan represents the breakthrough and the deliverance that comes after a long season of adversity and waiting. It represents that period that is coming to an end, because this is a turning point. Now I'm at my text, because it is here at this moment that God begins to talk to his leader, Joshua, once again. And he reassures him of the great success that awaits him. Now, some of you got to be Bible scholars and remember in Joshua chapter 1 that God began to speak to Joshua and tell him this. This was right after the heels of a great leader passing away. Moses, the great deliverer, the great leader, the man they had great respect for, it, brought them this far, brought them out of Egypt. He died. And so Joshua was now touched to be his successor. And God speaks to him and lets him know, I'm going to be with you as I was with Moses. That no man's going to be able to stand before you all the days of your life. That everything you touch, I'm going to be with you. Just be strong, Joshua. Be courageous. I'm going to be with you. I want to talk to somebody in here that God has challenging you to be strong, to be courageous. You've been tapped to be the next whatever. You've been tapped to be the next ministry leader. You've been tapped to take on a new responsibility. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're a new husband or you're a new wife or you're taking a new job. You're taking a new position and you're a little bit intimidated by it. And the private conversation that happens between you and God when he's trying to reassure you on a personal level. On the outside, you want to portray confidence. I got this. I'm good. But on the inside, you're thinking, oh, God, how am I going to raise these kids Anybody ever done that? I've done that. Where you put up a real strong front. How you doing? I'm blessed. I'm highly favored. Got it together. I know what I'm doing. And on the inside, you think, oh, God, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not sure how this is going to work out. Moses was a great leader. I could never follow in his shoes. I could never walk behind him. And these people now looking at me, expecting me to be him, but I'm not him. And what am I supposed to do? And God says, I got you. God said to tell somebody in here, I got you. God, I got to raise these kids by myself. I got you. Come on, somebody. God, I don't even know what I'm doing if I'm qualified for the job. God says, I got you. 
God, I don't know what I'm doing. I've been in this cycle before. I'm not even sure if I have the skill set, the talent, the ability, the long shot. I'm, God says, I got you. Look at somebody say, I got you. I'll be with you. But in our text, the conversation goes past personal assurance. And it begins to go and talk to the people that follow him. And so what you read later on is that God said, today I will exalt you. The word exalt means to magnify or give you honor in the eyes of all Israel. And check this out. So that they may know that I'm with you. In other words, it's one thing for you to be confident in yourself. But it's another thing for the people that follow you or work with you or connected to you to know that they believe in you, that they respect you. So in other words, it was not just going to be a turning point for him. This is going to be a turning point for them because this moment was going to change how they perceived him as a leader. It was going to change how they perceived him as a person who gets things done. It was going to change how they viewed him. Let me ask you a question, beloved. How do people, how do people see you? People say it don't matter what people think, but it really does. How people perceive you has a great deal to do with what you're able to do or how you impact people. Follow what I'm saying? If somebody walks up to you in the Bible, you see them often say, I perceive you to be a man or a woman of God. I perceive you to be. That many times people respond to you based on how they perceive you, right? It's their perception. I perceive that you are a man or a woman of God. And so there are some people who erroneously think that you can live any kind of way, act any kind of way, do anything you want to do, and that you'll still be anointed. And it's true. You'll still be anointed. But perception has to do with influence. It's how I perceive you. If I perceive you to be somebody that can't be trusted with money, I'm not going to put you in the finance room. If I perceive that you're somebody who doesn't have self-discipline and doesn't have self-control, I'm not going to put you in a position that's going to put us in danger because I perceive. Sometimes you're dealing with people, it's not just about what they say, it's about how you perceive them. I have to be able to look at you and think or believe what about you makes me think that you should be a leader or you should be given responsibility. And so perceptions matter. And God in this moment is going to do something in your life that's going to change people's opinion about you. Because this is what I found out, that you can't change people's opinion about you. Whatever they think is what they think. It could be wrong, it could be erroneous, it could be off, it could be crazy. And you know how people do sometimes, I I perceive in my spirit. (laughs) And sometimes they just off, you don't see nothing, you crazy. You had pizza last night. Had a dream about me after you ate some pizza last night. Go back, talk to God. But perception is important because people, how people see you determines how they deal with you. I'm going to say it again for him. Thank you. How people perceive you, in large part, determines how people deal with you. That there are some people who give things or support you because they perceive that you are a respectable person. And if I perceive that you're not an honorable person, it's going to give me a different reaction. You ever had this happen to you? You can say something to your kids until your tongue turn blue. And somebody can come right in and say something and they will act like, oh, my God, it's the most amazing thing. Because their perception is, that's mom, she's just fussing, that's dad, he's just fussing at me. And somebody else can come along and say something and get a different result because of how they perceive them. That if you're going to be a minister, if you're going to be somebody in leadership, it's not just about having a position, it's how they perceive you, how they view you, what comes to people's minds when they mention your name. That your name should be synonymous with integrity, dependability, respect, 
availability. All those positive things should come to people's minds. When I say the name Connie, certain things could come to my mind about Connie because my perception of her is intact. Whenever people start mentioning your name and it is synonymous with something negative, that's not a good thing. And so you're going to be ineffective when it comes to moving things as long as people's perception of you is skewed. And how many of you know it's like to make mistakes and have messed up how people perceive you? How, how many of you have ever felt the intimidation of walking into a situation where you may have been ill-equipped, unprepared? Maybe you are immature, but God has put you in a place. Let me tell you something. If God has put you in a place and given you an opportunity, don't you dare back out of it. If God opens a door for you to stand in a place, if he's God enough to open the door, you need to be man enough or woman enough to walk through the door that he has sent you in. Oh, yeah, I'm talking in here. I'm talking in here. Because sometimes God perceives something in you that you don't even perceive in yourself. And oh my God, God is not just trying to talk to you about you, but he's also talking to other people about you. And suddenly you will see people's minds changing about you who didn't like you before. See, the heart of the king is in God's hand. And he can turn it any way he wants to. And suddenly the boss that can't stand you all of a sudden wants to promote you because God is turning their... For somebody right now, you're dealing with a difficult family member or a difficult child or a difficult church member and you're ready to just write it off and walk away. But God said, I'm changing their hearts about you right now. This is something that God has to do. Some people think they got to bogart their way into situations and walk in with their credentials and force their way into opportunities. But if you just relax and let God turn the hearts of people, suddenly people will like you who maybe shouldn't even like you and they don't even know why. It's because God is turning. Look at somebody say, God's turning it right now. Somebody needs an opportunity. Somebody needs a loan. Somebody needs favor. Somebody needs a door open. Somebody at a critical moment in their life, they don't have enough money to do what they need to do. But God said, I'm changing somebody's heart right now. Somebody's going to like you and it's going to surprise you. Oh, I wish you heard me up in here. God's going to give somebody promotions and jobs and interviews. You're going to walk into interviews and people are going to say, I don't even know why I'm giving you this job. I don't, I don't even know why I'm giving you my business. I don't even know why I'm going to give you this opportunity. I'm not even sure why I just met you. But it's because God is turning their heart right now. Somebody give God praise if you're glad that God was able to change somebody's heart. Oh, you ought to be glad. You know why you ought to be glad? Because sometimes, beloved of God, we spend so much time Investing so much energy, energy in the trying to change people's minds. And we clout chasing and running behind people and spending money and trying to be noticed and tap dancing and trying to be seen. If you spent more time getting in God's face rather than trying to get in people's face. God will do in a few minutes with all your money and your gymnastics and you selling your body and all that will never get you in the door. Look at somebody say, get in God's face. If you get in God's face, when God opens a door, no man can shut it. If I got a witness in here, you give God 30 seconds of your best praise because God gave me favor. Sometimes the situation God has put you in is not for you, but it's about the people who you will influence. Anybody remember Jesus standing at the, loom of, at the tomb of Lazarus? And he looks up and he prays and he says, Father, I know you hear me. I know you hear me. I don't even have to say anything to you. I, I know that you hear me when I pray. He said, but for the sake of these that are standing by. That sometimes it's not even about, see, what you think about me doesn't change my relationship with God. How you feel about me, whether you like my shoes or my suit or I don't like that color on you, none of that even matters. When you have a real relationship with God. When you have a real relationship with God, you ain't got to prove that to nobody. Yeah. Stop trying to prove stuff to people. Just be who you are. Just do what you do. 
Just let God bless you in the space that you're in. When God really blesses you, you ain't got to brag about it. I can see. Oh, my God. He said, for the, for, for the sake of these that are standing by, and here Jesus does something that many of us have to do. He could have willed him out of the grave. Yeah, he could have stood there and just shook his head. Yeah, he could have fought Lazarus out the grave. He could have waved his hand and made him come out the grave. But what he did was he spoke a word and he began to declare in the open his expectation. I wonder if there's anybody out here who believes God to the point of being a fool and begin to voice your expectation. Oh, I got to go. I ain't even got time. Is there anybody who's believing that God is going to raise a dead situation so much that you will stand over your pocketbook or stand over your children or stand over your own life and begin to declare the word of the Lord on your own life? I declare Lazarus, come up out this, come out of this grave. I'm calling my money out. I'm calling my emotions out. I'm calling, I'm speaking over my children. I'm speaking over my body. I know what the doctor said, but I'm speaking over my own body. You will be healed. You will be delivered. You will, I will get this blood sugar under control. I will get this cholesterol under control. Is there anybody in here right now who has enough faith to start speaking what you believe God is going to do? Jump up on your feet and say, I'm speaking it. You ain't speaking it. You ain't speaking it. You ain't speaking it. This money will come under control. I will get my credit together. I will have a house. I will be the head and not the tail. I will be able to sleep at night without sleeping pills. I will be able to function without drugs. I will be able to lift my family up. I will. You ain't speaking it right now. Look at somebody say, I will do it. You got to start talking about what you expect. That for some of you, your turning point is in your mouth right now. God told me to tell you, if you stop speaking negative and start speaking positive and start talking about what you expect, I will turn. You get what you expect. You get back what you put out there. If you put out there negativity, if you say it ain't going to work, if you say it ain't going to happen, then you're right. It's not going to happen. But for every radical, crazy person in here who believes that God is about to bless you in a crazy way, jump on your feet and say, I believe I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm the favorite of God. I'm the anointed of God. God's favor is on my life. Somebody tap your head and say, I got favor on my life. Sit down, sit down. So what God does sometimes is he sets up situations like this where you have to walk into your Jordan. Where you're facing something that's cutting you off from everything you believe in God for. And you have to stand there and be declared with the Lord. So same here. What God was about to do in this moment was going to strike fear in the heart of his enemies. That from this moment, it's not that Joshua hadn't had other moments. And it's not that he won't have other moments in the future. But there's something about this. This right here. This particular moment in time that's going to all of a sudden your reputation is going to go before you. And God said to tell somebody right now that what you're facing right now is a defining moment. He bought our shire. That this moment is going to change everything. That this right here is going to go before you and your enemies are going to hear about it. And know that God is with you. That this right here, they're going to look at and say, oh my God, God must be with her. <laughs> God must be with him. And you won't have to say anything about it. Your reputation is going to go out. And the enemies are going to hear about you walking across Jordan. Your enemies are going to hear you talk about you coming out of financial crisis. Your enemies are going to hear about you saving your marriage. Y'all not talking to me. Your enemies are going to hear about how God blessed your children. I wish I had some happy people in here. And, and it was going to inspire 
the people that followed him. Whether you know what I realize it or not, people are always watching. They're always watching. They may not say it, but they're always watching. Even most of you that are on Facebook, and you know this to be a fact, you can have 5,000 followers. 4,995 of them never say anything, but they're watching. <laughs> when you post something, they don't say nothing back. They don't push like, heart, hey, congratulations, or anything, but just know that they're always watching. And somebody right now, God is inspiring them through your life. They watch how you handle crisis. Yeah, it was bad. It should have broke you down. But you still came out smiling. And they're watching how you ha How'd you go through that? How'd you go through that and still come in the house praising God? How'd you go through that and still come to church every week? How'd you have that kind of pressure and still serve God faithfully? And sometimes people are watching how you handle stuff to be encouraged by how they, if she can go through it, I can go through it. If he can handle that kind of pressure, I can handle it. If she can stand up to it, I can stand up to it. If he can be there and be strong in the Lord, then I can be strong. Look at by somebody say, I'm a testimony. We ain't got time for testimony service like we used to. Because if we did, we'd be here all night long. But just look at somebody and say, I got a testimony. If you see me standing here, please believe that I came through hell. And I came through high water. And I came through enough stuff to kill a horse. And I should have been dead. And I should have been suicidal. So the fact that I walked up in here is a testimony. You was counting me out. And you thought I was done. And you thought it was over. But the last place you saw me is not the last place you're going to see me. If that's true, give somebody a praise. Give God a praise to somebody. Give God a crazy praise if that's your testimony. I'm still here. So number one, write this down. Let's talk about, let's talk about preparations. For what God was getting ready to do in their life and what he's getting ready to do in your life is going to require preparations. He told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow God is going to do amazing things. There are some things that are going to have to change. There are some things that the fact is, whoever you were or whatever you were before this is going to have to change. You're about to step over a date line. You're about to step into being a minister or being an elder or being a ministry leader or taking an opportunity. And can I be honest with you, some of the things that worked before are not going to work now. God said to tell somebody, for what you're about to step into now, there is no going back. You're not going to be able to be who you were and who you are at the same time. You have to consecrate yourself. The word consecrate means to separate, to set apart for special use. You have to recognize that God has spared you and set you aside for his personal use only. That means you're not going to be able to let everybody handle you and use you and take you everywhere they want to take you because I belong to God. God has sanctified me and put me aside. I can't go everywhere. I can't be with everybody. I can't associate with everybody. I can't be in certain settings not because I'm better than you and not because I don't like you, but God has put me aside for a special use. Look at somebody say, consecrate yourself. Your problem is you're trying to be you and be who he called you to be at the same time. Consecrate yourself. That means you may not be able to go to every event. Y'all done stole your joy now. You may not be able to wear what everybody else wear. You may not be able to go where everybody else go. Your name can't be in everything that's being talked about. Your face can't be in the place that everybody is. Because God has set me aside. This is what, this is what blows my mind about people. People think that it's the leader's job to give you something to do. To put you in position. And so sometimes 
when it comes to leadership, people will get mad and leave a church or leave a department or leave a job because they say, it's your fault that I'm not being advanced. But the truth of the matter is not my job to use you. Ooh, y'all got quiet. It's not my job to choose you. It's God's job to choose you. Thank you, Mark, for, for clapping. Thank you, sister. It's, so there's no need in getting mad at me because I don't give you what you perceive you want. The real issue is God. He's the one that chooses you. We're about to send 10 ministers up to get their license this year. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you can clap for them. And each of them have been preparing and studying and getting ready to step into another level of leadership and responsibility. And I said to them, I didn't choose you. He chose you. It's not my job to say, I like her, I like him, I want him, and choose you. God chose you. I'm just agreeing with what he's already ordained. So now because he chose you, your task is to be prepared for God to use you. Your job is to be the sharpest knife in the drawer in case he wants to use you. Am I an impact church? Your job is to put yourself in the best possible light to prepare yourself to be in a place of prayer, to be in a place of preparation. And should God reach in his drawer and pull out a knife, he wants to pull out you. But that's his choice. My desire is, Lord, if you want to use anybody, use me. Come on, somebody. You got a whole lot of knives in the drawer. You got a whole lot of people you can use. But I just want God to use me. How many people want God to use you? Yeah, you got a whole lot of people to choose from. I'm not the smartest, the sharpest, the most educated, but I am the most willing. I will get up at three in the morning and I will pray. I will show up at church ahead of time. I will make myself available. I'll be working when other people are sleeping because I want God to choose me. Is there anybody in here that wants God to choose you? Jump on your face and say, Lord, use me. Use me. I got weaknesses, I got flaws, I got issues, but you can use me. I will outwork you, I will outrun you, I will outpray you, I will outperform you because I want God to use me. Clap your hands if you want God to use me. Preparation. Put yourself in a position for God. Consecrate yourself. And if you consecrate yourself, I'm going to do amazing things. Oh God, among you. I'm going to do things that no man could do. I'm going to do stuff that you couldn't do yourself. Step back and let me do this. All I want you to do is consecrate yourself. Number two, I want to talk to you about platforms. He told the priest to go and stand where? In the Jordan. I want you to go and stand in the place of turbulence. And the place of turbulence is going to be your platform. Oh, I'm talking in here. I'm dropping bombs in here. See, see, a lot of times we talk about platforms. We think the stage is the platform. <laughs> you think the pulpit is the platform. I just got to get on the stage. I just got to be on the pulpit. I just got to be in the camera because you think that this is the platform but the platform in reality is your life that it's your life that as you step into certain situation that God goes with you and God goes before you and so it's the things that you have endured it's the turbulence in your life if you're looking for the place where God is going to show up he's going to show up at the intersections at the challenging places in the divorce in the layoff in the firing in the challenges in the issues that you have that is going to become the place and the things that you're going through 
right now, that's going to be your platform. I don't need you up here. I need you on your own platform to be the place where God is going to show up in your life. Good God Almighty. Somebody right now is watching the Almighty God step on the platform of your pain and your pain becomes your message and you thought I needed a pulpit and a collar, baby. God was standing up in my life when I couldn't put two nickels together and I didn't know what I was going to do in my life. God showed up and started preaching. If I got a witness in here that God will show up on the platform of your life, give God a praise right here. God will show up. Slap somebody and say, God's going to show up. God's going to show up. Oh, you ain't slapping them. Slap them. I say, God's going to show up. The thing you're running from is the thing God said is my platform. I let you go through that because I needed a place to stand up and be God. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro in the whole earth seeking to show himself strong. Look at somebody and say, God's about to show up. It's not in your title. It's not in your position. It's not in your name. But it's in the God that shows up on the platform of your life. God's about to show up. Look at somebody say, this is my platform. This is my platform. You don't know. This is my platform. This is my. This is the place that God's going to use to catapult me into positions of opportunity because of my platform. Now, I got to emphasize this because this is a message to this generation in particular. Because in Moses' generation, check this out. In Moses' generation, when he brought them out of Egypt, God blew, when they come to the Red Sea, God blew on the Red Sea, and the Israelites walked through on dry ground. You got to follow me here. In Moses' generation, when they got to the edge, God blew, and the Red Sea opened up, and they walked through on dry ground. But in Joshua's generation, the priests had to go all the way into the water, and it wasn't until their feet touched the water. <laughs> It wasn't until they were ankle deep in the situation that they saw the miracle of God. For somebody, you're worried right now because you're saying, I don't even want to go through it. But for this generation, God said, I want you to stick your foot in it. You ain't going to better stand back here and watch me do it. I want you to put your foot in it. I want you to get some skin in the game. When I see you have enough faith to get into the situation, then I'm going to show up and do miracles. Why? Because you're going to have to have your own testimony. You can't rely on mama's testimony. You can't rely on grandmama's testimony. You're going to have to have a testimony for yourself. Same God, different situation. Same God, different circumstance. Same God, different river. Same God, different... Your Jordan is your story. This is going to be your own story. So many of us, so many of us, we don't rely on the faith of our parents and our grandparents. Mama prayed me through. Grandma paid, prayed me through. Whenever something happens in your life, you want to call mama. Mama, pray for me. Or call daddy. Call your old Baptist bishop uncle and say, pray for me. Oops. I don't know where that came from. It came out of nowhere. I don't But God is pushing you into situations where you're going to have to know God for yourself. You're going to have to know, you're going to have to know that when you pray, he hears you. You're going to have to know when you speak the word, things will happen. You're going to have to know that you can step into a situation and change the atmosphere. And this is a turning point. Oh my God. Look at somebody say, I got my own story. 
I got my own story. I got my own moments of crisis when I didn't know what I was going to do. And I had to call on the name of the Lord and he opened the way. I got my own story about how my back was against the wall and I didn't know how I was going to come out. I got my own story about my enemies that was trying to kill me and destroy me and God stayed with me. And here's how I know that the Lord favors me because he had not allowed my enemies to triumph over me. If there's anybody that's glad that whatever the devil tried to do, it didn't work. Would you give God a shout right here? Your pain is your platform. This is my platform. This is my space. I got my own story. Number three and I'm done. I want to talk to you about performances. Verse 10 said this. This is how you will know that the living God is among you. This is how you will know. Because I will drive out before you all your enemies. Write this down. At the end of the day, results matter. At the end of the day, results matter. Connie, people talk too much. They get on my nerves. They talk too much, Adrian, and they produce nothing. And we good for talking a good game and ain't doing nothing. I can do this. I can change this. I can produce this. And I sit there and look at it and say, let me see. We're good at shouting about stuff Mark, stuff Mark Brown that we never possess. The preacher preached something. You go into a shout. The band goes in. We run around the building. But you're shouting about stuff that you never possess. And God said to tell you that this is a turning point in your life where you stop shouting about stuff that you never actually possess. Shut up and start producing. Tell me what you can do. Show me what you can do. And we're good for that. And we're good for that. We're good at talking about stuff. Woo! God's going to do it, but you never actually produce it. Joshua was going to be a producer. And he was going to move from just having a position to having influence. I tell people all the time, if you're ever in a situation where you have to choose between position or influence, go for the influence. Because everybody got position don't have influence. Oh, I might be in the wrong church. I should have went back to California with this one. Everybody that's running around with a title ain't getting stuff done. Everybody that got the job is not being effective. But through this circumstance, God is going to graduate you. He's going to promote you from being somebody who just talk about it. And now you're going to be about it. You're not going to talk about being blessed. You're going to start walking into blessing. Y'all not hearing me. You're not going to talk about what you got. You ain't got to say nothing, actually. They're going to see the hand of God. Look at somebody and say, it's time to produce. It's time to produce. God is, oh God, I got to go. God is trying to raise up a generation of leaders, of Christians, who are walking the walk and talking the talk. To move us from people who just have a cross hanging around your neck and a bumper sticker on your car. But when was the last time God was able to send you into a community, into a job, and you actually begin to win somebody for Jesus Christ? When was the last time somebody could call you to pray for them and they got a breakthrough? When was the last time somebody was able to call you and you cast out a demon? Forget calling the pastor. I'm talking about you. If you're a believer, the Bible said that you should drink any deadly thing and that you could walk on serpents and scorpions and that you would have the power to cast out demons. Stop calling me at 2 o'clock in the morning because you got a devil downstairs. You better lay hands on that devil yourself. I might be sleeping. But the power of God that rests in you say I can step into that situation and I can arrest this spirit right now. I will go into my prayer language and start casting down every not. Somebody start doing this for me. 
What are you doing, Pastor? I'm pulling down high things. I'm pulling down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Stop making excuses for why you got to run to this church and that church and the other church. God says stand flat-footed where you are and look that devil right in the eye and begin to cast... I want to raise up a church full of doers, not talkers. We want to be known for what we do, not just what we say. Because people can say anything. You could say, you could say, you could walk in with a resume a mile long, but I want to see you produce. If I give you something to do, I want to come back later and say, they did what they said. They produce. The power that God gave you, Mark, is not just so you could dance. It's so that you can produce. If a tree is supposed to yield apples and year after year it don't produce no apples, don't say that the husbandman is mad because he cut down the tree. <laughs> and God is saying, I put some of you in good situations. I put you in good soil. I put you in good opportunities because I was expecting to get juice. I was expecting to get fruit out of you. I wanted to see you produce. I wanted to see you go forth. I wanted to see you be effective. And I'm going to release you in this season. This is a turning point. For somebody, this whole message is a turning point in your life. Yes, I'm talking to you who have decided to sit back and watch other people do what God has called you to do. It's now time for you to step up. Here's a verse that's interesting. A couple verses down. Because they were able to walk into this Jordan and the people saw the miraculous work of God, the Bible said that the people saw him and they had awe for him. Because suddenly, the Bible says, they realized that God was with Joshua like he was with Moses. Oh God. For somebody right now, Stop arguing with people. God is going to prove that he's with you. God is going to show up and prove that I am with you. You ain't got to get out of character and get into no argument and start cutting people off and blocking people. That if you just close your mouth and let the Lord fight your battles, God said, I'm going to be with you, God. I'm going to be with you. Lift your hands up and say, Lord, be with me. Be with me. They've been laughing at me, God, but be with me. They've been saying it ain't going to work, but be with me. They've been saying you're going to fail, but be with me. They've been saying that you're crazy and you're stupid and you don't know what you're doing, but God, be with me. They've been saying that I'm weird and I'm retarded and I need to be locked away somewhere, but God, be with me. Somebody lift your hands and say, Lord, be with me. Be with me when I go to court. Be with me when I go down to the job. Be with me when I go down to the school. Be with me when I go into the courtroom. Be with me. Let me close with this. When Joshua sent the priest forward, when their feet hit the water, the waters parted, and they all started walking through on dry land. It was one thing that he... He, he, he told him to do, and I couldn't close this mess without telling him this. The Bible said he told 12 men to take stones out of the middle of the riverbed, right where the priest's feet stood, right in the place where there was turbulence. I want you to pick up 12 stones and take them with you to the other side of the bank and set them up on the other side of the river. After you come through it, set up these stones. And here's what he said. When your children ask you, what do these stones mean, Daphne? When the kids come back and say, why you got these stones here? I want you to look at the stones and say, this was the spot. This was the place that the Jordan River cut us off. But the Lord opened up a way for us. This was the place 
This was the spot. This was the turning point. This was the situation that changed my life. This was the thing that made me pray like I do. When they start asking you, how did you get through it? I want you to take them all the way back. Is there anybody in here who's got a testimony, who's got some stones that you can point back at and say, this is the spot. This was the turning point. This was the moment that changed everything for me. This was the thing that made me who I am. In other words, beloved, God don't just want you to come out of it. He wants you to come out of it with a testimony. If you come out with no testimony, then everything you're going through is a waste of time. I don't want you to just come out. I want you to come out with proof. You're going to affect future generations. That there are going to be people that you can go back to and say, this is the spot. And every once in a while, when you get in a faith fight, when you get in a battle, you got to go back to the spot, Mark Brown, and say, this was the spot that God brought. Oh, Jesus, I got to close this out. This is the spot God brought me. When, when doubt comes in and I'm not sure what God's going to do, I can go all the way back to my spot and say, Lord, this is the spot where you changed my life, where you filled me with the Holy Ghost, where you gave me a prayer life, where you helped me raise these kids, where you gave me a job. This, is there anybody that's got a testimony in here that this is the spot? Lift your hands and say, Lord, I thank you for the spot. Sometimes, sometimes God doesn't have to do anything new. He just takes you back to what he's already done. That every once in a while, when I'm up against something, I got to pull out my resume and talk about the last thing that God brought me through and go back. See, some of y'all wait for God to do a new thing before you praise God, but I'm still praising God for the stuff he already did. Is there anybody in here who's glad for what God has already done? Jump on your feet and give God a praise for what he's... If he don't do nothing else, if I don't get a new job, thank God for the last job. Somebody give God 30 seconds of your best praise for what he's already done. Come on, I need to see some stones. I need to see some monuments. I need to hear some testimonies. I need to see some praises for what God has This is the spot. This is the spot. I cried, but it was a turning point. I was worried, but it was a turning point. I was frustrated, but it was a turning point. I was mad, but it was a turning point. See, see, you, you know, you know that God has done a work in your life when you can look back at things that were a crisis and begin to thank him now for what you went through then. I wish I had, I wish I had some people who would praise God, who would look back and say, when I was going through it, I was worried. When I was going through I was scared when I was going through I didn't think I was gonna make it but now somebody lift your hand begin to worship God in here and thank you for what he's already done what he's already done what he's already done the same God the same God that brought you through that is gonna bring you through this. It's just another turning point. It's just another testimony. It's just another opportunity for God to show himself strong in your life. If it didn't kill you then, if jail didn't kill you, if abuse didn't kill you, if rape didn't kill you, if getting fired didn't kill you, if losing your job didn't kill you, how in the world is this gonna kill me? Lift your hand and give God a praise in here. Lift your hand and give God a praise in here. If you're glad that God has blessed you, give God a praise in here. Hallelujah. 
Listen, lift your hand and give God 30 seconds right here. This worship right here. 30 seconds right here. 30 seconds right here. 30 seconds right here. And I want you to start thinking about all the things that God has brought you through already. All the things he's pulled you out of. All the times they didn't think you was going to make it. All the times they didn't think you was going to make it out of. All the times they didn't think you was going to get up. All the times they counted you out and didn't think you was going to make it. But you're a survivor. I'm still here. It was a turning point. If I didn't have that moment, I couldn't have this moment. So you're going to have to excuse me for a minute while I give God some kind of praise for the things he's already done. For the things he brought me through. For the things I stepped over. For the things I survived. I want all the survivors in here to give God a mighty shout and a mighty praise. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I got receipts, y'all. I got receipts for what God has done for me. I got receipts. This is a turning point. You will not die here. You will not go down here. You will not be killed here. My life's about to change. Yeah. 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 Do this for me. Would you prophesy to somebody standing next to you and tell them you will come out of it? You will come out of it. You will get out of this. You will get up. You will. How do you know? Because I made it. You will come out of it. You will get out of this. You will survive this. You will survive and I prophesy I am. Lift your hand and tell him, Lord, you're a way maker. Way maker.